Hello, DFS family. Welcome back to the Sunday School NFL DFS podcast powered by Fantasy Six Pack. I'm your host, Pat Mikowski. You can find me on Twitter at PattyMac33. I am joined by my co host, Mr. David Eddy, whom you can find on Twitter at Corporal Eddy. Now, before we get started, please do us a quick favor and hit that like button. If you enjoyed this podcast, do yourself a favor and hit that subscribe button. You want to keep a leg up on all your buddies and swing on over to fantasysixpack.net to check out more great content. I just wanted to give a shout out to my co-host and say thank you, David. Uh, for not even entering a lineup into our weekly contest last week. Therefore, I won by default, not the way that I like to win, but a win is a win, and this late in the season, I will take it. Well, I, you know, I got to thinking about it, Patrick, and I was trying to come up with a way that I could let you win without like making it obvious that I was just throwing the, the the con you know the contest and so I thought to myself wait a minute if I don't enter then I can't possibly win so tis the season Patrick early Christmas present from myself to you sir well I I really appreciate it Dave uh, hopefully it'll get me trending in the right direction um. So we'll see what happens. Maybe I can put a little bit of a streak together here the last few weeks. I, I would be okay with that. So let's uh, let's jump right into this thing. Um, you know, we're continuing on with our, our new uh, little segment here, our Virgin Mary question of the week. Um, so let's get into this week's question, Dave. Um, what is the best way to approach the flex position? Are running backs, wide receivers, or tight ends a better option? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a, a good question because there's certainly a lot of ways, uh, you know, that you could go with that. Popular, you know, thought has always been, you know, running backs uh, just because, you know, typically they are the more stable position. You can usually kind of project their their scores more accurately than you can, you know, either, you know, wide receivers or tight ends. Um, as time has gone on a little bit and, you know, stacking has became, if not just a thing, almost mandatory, you know, wide receivers, um, have definitely became more popular in, in the flex spot. Uh, you, I I mean, legally speaking, you know, you can play a tight end in the text, in the, uh, flex position for, for me, you know, that position is just so weak and, and so shallow, um, you know, each and every week. Personally, it's just a rule of thumb, and I, you know I wouldn't sit there and harp on anybody too drastically um, if they played a tight end in the flex position. But that is something that I 100% avoid. There, you know, just usually isn't two tight ends that have a great value that have um, you know the the upside to to play there. So it's pretty much running back or wide receiver for me. It really depends on how you like to stack. I would say. If you're trying to, you know, include a secondary stack because you're playing a really large field tournament, then wide receiver is typically the place to go because, you know, you really do kind of need that extra spot to match up, uh, you know, wide receivers from the same game or to match up, you know, your tight end, you know, with with a run back from that same game. If you're more just, you know, stacking your quarterback or even if I guess you're not stacking anything at all, then running back, I guess, would be, you know, a better option. But each week is a little bit different, so that's just kind of the general rule of thumb. But, um, you know, that's the way that, you know, you should be looking to approach the position. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm that I'm that guy that is okay with stacking uh, with a tight end in that flex position. Running it out a few occasions this year. You, th- you think it maybe that's happen. why you lose all the time, Patrick? It, it very well may be. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that it doesn't have uh, uh, any uh, effect on the outcome, but there has been a couple times this year, you know, where I've looked at that flex position and, you know, you see like a, um, 
you know, a Kelsey and a Kittle or a Waller, um, you know, and, and between those three guys, you know, two of them for the money um, and the matchup, they're just better options than some of the wide receivers or the running backs that are left on the board at the same price point. Uh, so occasionally, yeah, I'll drop a couple tight ends in there. I don't do it often, uh, but if I really like the matchup for one um, and the price point is better um, and I feel that the ceiling is higher uh, than a running back or a receiver that's available at that price point, then I absolutely will double up on tight ends. So. And, and I would say a piece of advice that I think really often you know, gets overlooked, and it, just, it seems so simple. But I, I really think that it's it's important to, you know, at least make mention and, you know, for someone to, to, you know, generally think this. Like, it doesn't matter what I think or what Pat thinks or anything that you read. At the end of the day, you are investing your own money. So right. if you just absolutely love something and, you know, it's on, you know, it's on our fade list, play it. Because that's your money that you're playing. If you're confident and you really think that, man, David Montgomery against the Lions this week, man, that that is that is the matchup. He's my favorite running back this week. Oh, wait a minute. Well, oh, Dave makes a lot of good points, but why he shouldn't play? Well, maybe I won't. And then he goes crazy. Well, shame on you. Not shame on me. Shame on you for not you know following your gut. So, you know, when it comes to to any any position, any player, anything you want to do, it's your money. So make sure that. You're putting out a lineup that you're comfortable spending your money on, and that way, win or lose, you know it. You know it's something that you can live with. Yeah, that's what you know. That's great advice, um, and that's typically why I've been losing this year is because I've been listening to what Dave has to say. Oh I yeah, think. sure, okay. <laughs> uh, but no, it, you're a hundred percent correct, Dave. Uh, you know, everybody has their own opinion, and we all know what people think of opinions you know they're like assholes everybody's got them and they all stink so uh you know run your game uh if you've got a gut feeling about something then by all means go with it Uh, we're just here for the entertainment purposes that's it well speaking of uh entertainment purposes patrick why don't you uh entertain me uh with your gospel this week yeah um so i am Going to Mr. Kirk Cousins at $6,400, the Jags at the Vikings. You know, over the last four weeks, Jacksonville's given up the seven most points in the NFL to quarterbacks uh, at just over 21 a game um, and giving up the fourth most points to wide receivers uh, at over 44 a game, not to mention uh, Delvin Cook. Uh, has had the fifth most targets by any running backs over the last four weeks as well. So we're all aware of the weapons that Mr. Cousins has at his disposal, you know, with Thielen and Jefferson and Cooks and Rudolph had a good game last week. And, um, you know, the guy that just gets lost in that mix is Kirk Cousins. Uh, you know, he did this last year. He went on a nice little streak last year where he was one of the most productive uh, quarterbacks in the league. Um, you know, this guy over the last six games is averaging 22.8 fantasy points a game. He's thrown three touchdowns in four of his last six. He's throwing it for over 270 yards a game. He's only got one interception in his last five. Uh, he's playing some of the best football to date. Um, and he runs into a juicy matchup against the Jags. Uh, This is the seventh best price tag uh, on the slate for a quarterback. I'm going to roll with the MSU alum in this one, Captain Kirk. Uh, I think there's a lot of fun stacking options with Minnesota in this one as well. Well, my friend, as you already know, you and I are kind of on opposite spectrums here on this one. Um, I think that Kurt Cousins this week is definitely a a viable option at quarterback. Um, I will have zero shares of him. Um, So, you know, obviously I couldn't advocate him personally as a core play. Um, Let's see. Kurt Cousins is looking to be the one, two, three, four, five, sixth most 
uh, own quarterback at about 7%. So you're not getting too bad there, you know, if, if he were to go off. And he definitely has the targets or the weapons, you know. Uh, I mean, Thielen and Jefferson, either one of those guys can go crazy. And Cook can do it through the air as well. But I'm on the opposite side um, here on this. My core play is Dalvin Cook. Uh, 9500 bucks. so you're, you're paying a price for him. But, um, you know, uh, you could say that every week I think Cook could pretty much be a core player for you, and I think it would be justified. Uh, I know he had a down game last week. He scored just, you know, 11.2 points. Keep in mind, however, he missed an entire quarter with a leg injury. So, you know, that 11-2 is a little bit misleading, but at the same time, you know, that leg injury does give you a little bit of, you know, pause uh, for running him out this week. Now, if anything, I am hopeful that that is going to drive down Cook's ownership. So in this matchup, he's going against the fifth worst defense in points per game allowed to running backs. For me, when it comes to core plays, typically it's really simple. Just don't overthink things. In DFS, that usually leads you down the wrong path. Cook is an absolute beast. He is the alpha dog in that offense. He has a great matchup at home. Just let it rip. Yeah, uh, week in and week out. You know, we've talked about it on several occasions. There's a couple guys uh, at the running back position that it just doesn't matter what the matchup is, who it is, what the game script or the plan is. Um, You know they're going to get the rock. You know they're going to tote it well. And they're going to be productive. Uh, The only thing uh, for me with Delvin Cook is just that price tag. Um, I'm cheap sometimes, and – and uh, you really got to be thrifty if you're if you're forking out you know nine and a half k for for a single guy. So um, so yep, uh, good play, uh, definitely a core play. He's going to be highly owned because of the matchup. Uh, but why don't uh, why don't you move on down and and let us know who it is that you're fading this week, Dave? Well, I'm going to fade a guy that is going to be more highly owned than Dalvin Cook and is you know. I don't know, a, a third the player at best. Um, I, I am not, well, I can't say I'm not playing. I am very much going to be underweight on David Montgomery. Uh, he's 5500 bucks as the Bears go up against the Lions. Montgomery is going to be, I mean, second or third highest owned back on this slate. Um, with Josh Jacobs being out, I think... Devontae Booker is probably going to end up being the the most highly owned quarterback or uh, running back. And then I think Montgomery slides in right behind him. Uh, you know, David Montgomery, no question about that. He owns the Chicago backfield, and he should. Uh, you know, he's seen 80% of the snaps this year. He's also going up against a, as we know, Patrick, horrific um, defense. However, don't forget, man, this is David Montgomery. And... All he does is leave, you know, fantasy points on the table. Now, early in the season, um, you know, Tariq Cohen went down with an injury, and this guy has seen all the touches that he can handle. But you know what he's done with them? Nothing. Nothing. Pretty much nothing. Three times this year, he has hit that 3X mark. Last week was the only time this year he's hit the 4X mark that we're looking for. He's cheap. He's going to get a lot of touches. He has a fantastic matchup. He's going to be highly owned, and I'm going to be fading him because it is almost guaranteed that he is going to disappoint like he always does. Yeah. um, He is very uh, disappointing, I think, is probably the best word. Um, You know, as far as a running back with – opportunity i mean like you said the guys had nothing but opportunity and he hasn't been able to capitalize on it um the price point is really good the matchup is really good um like you said he's going to be extremely high owned just because of those couple things and the fact that he did show a pulse last week i think as well um so i i won't be fading him completely out of the picture Um, I'll have a few lineups out there with them uh, just because of those three, you know, the matchup, uh, the fact that he was breathing last week um, and that price point, I think is pretty good for an RB one. So for me, uh, I'm sticking at the quarterback position. 
Um, and my devil this week is going to be Matt Ryan. Uh, 5,600 bucks, the Saints at the Falcons. Now, there is absolutely nothing appealing about this matchup. In their meeting just two weeks ago, in week 11, Ryan was 19 for 37, 232 yards, zero touchdowns, two interceptions, to the tune of 7.28 fantasy points. Matt Ryan is the sixth most sacked quarterback in the NFL, taking 28 sacks this year. And the Saints have the sixth most sacks in the NFL with 33. There's only three quarterbacks in the NFL that have been pressured more than Matt Ryan this season, a 24.4% on the dropbacks. And there's only three teams in the NFL that pressure the quarterback more than the Saints. 25.6% of the dropbacks. Over the last four weeks, the Saints have given up a mind-blowing 5.44. Yes, 5.44 fantasy points a game to opposing quarterbacks. The likes of Tom Brady, Mullen out in San Francisco, Matty Ryan, and then obviously uh, Denver's makeshift quarterback situation last week. But still, 5.44 is pretty stinking impressive. Run and hide, Matt Ryan. Miss the bus. Forget your cleats. Break a fingernail. Stay away from Matty Ice this weekend. What's cooler than being cold, Dave? It's ice cold, man. Matt Ryan is a fade this week. Yeah, he's definitely uh, been interesting this year. I know last year I played him quite a bit because... He kind of was in the Justin Herbert model that he's in this year where they were constantly behind and, you know, they were just chucking that ball around. But yeah, it's, it's been way too hit and miss this week. I think that there's much better options to play at quarterback, uh, you know, especially if Julio Jones is going to be out. So yeah, I can, I'm all behind not playing Matt Ryan. I will have zero Matt Ryan shares this week. So how about uh, how about your pivot, David? What do you well, got for your pivot? This is a kid that I've just been liking more and more than most. <clears throat> um, and I've been finding myself playing him with, you know, moderate success. Um, <clears throat> so my pivot this week is going to be Michael Pittman. Uh, 4900 bucks uh, for the Colts against the Texans. Now this game has the potential to be just high scoring, man. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and the game is going to be played in a dome, which, you know, it, it, to be honest, when you, especially now when you get to this time of the year, I mean, weather always plays a factor, but it really gets to be a factor this time of the year. So to me, that's a, a, a thumbs up to, you know, anything played in a dome. Now, listen, man, it, it's always tough to trust, you know, Colts players because they really like to spread the ball around. But 4900 bucks this week, he comes in at a real nice value. Easy to slide into a secondary stack. Um as, you know, a run back option. And, and, you know, let's be honest, he's got a great matchup. Texans are giving up the seventh most points per game against wide receivers this year. And Pittman not only leads the team in um, snap percentage over the last four weeks, as he's had at least 80% every game during that period, but he's also leading them in target share. Now, granted, it's only 18%, but, you know, I'd rather have the guy that's leading in target share. For some reason, um, he does continue to be low-owned, and I think you can probably get him at like 5% or less this week. Yeah, he's kind of taken over that that number one receiver role from T.Y. Hilton, um, who actually had a pretty decent game last week. Um, But he's turned into Phillip Rivers' favorite target um, you know, on the outside, uh, the kid's got a lot of talent. Uh, he's got some upside, um, and he's productive. He catches the football. Uh, now Philip Rivers' arm isn't exactly what it used to be, um, if it ever was to begin with. Uh, but uh, I think that's a, a really nice play at a good price point uh, in a good matchup, uh, and I think that you can definitely benefit from that. So, um. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick at the wide receiver position myself uh, for my archangel this week, and I'm going with 
you know, a guy that we've talked about a few times so far this year, um, especially recently, uh, and Josh Reynolds, uh, $4,200 for the Rams um, at the Cardinals. Uh, this is an obvious pivot, you know, from number one and number one a one a in in the Rams lineup with uh, Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, um, who are at sixty one hundred and fifty nine hundred respectively this week, and are one of the most dynamic duos uh, in the NFL, and they have both just absolutely gotten their rocks off the last few years against the Cardinals. Uh, Robert Woods, 37 catches, 466 yards and two touchdowns. Cooper Cup, 28 catches, 346 yards and three touchdowns. Pat Peterson's going to have to try to slow one of these guys down. Arizona's given up the eighth most fantasy points a game to wide receivers over the last four weeks at just over 42 and a half points. So there is plenty to go around for Reynolds. Um, over the Rams' last five games, Reynolds is seeing eight targets a game. He's averaging five catches and a little over 50 yards a game. If he finds the end zone in this one, uh, then boom, man, you've got that magical 4X number. It's in play. Uh, once again, I think there's some pretty creative and fun stacking options in this game as well. Yeah, Josh Reynolds is always an option. It's That offense is a little bit screwy because they play three running backs and they've got two good tight ends and they've got, you know, three quality receivers. So, you know, it's hard to trust that he's going to get volume. But, um, you know, as a pivot, I, I think it is going to often, you know, make sense. Um, but speaking of, of making sense, let's, uh, let's get to our contrarian plays of the week because these typically don't make sense. Uh, but I think you've got an especially interesting one uh, this week for maybe different reasons than usual. So why don't you get with your heresy for this week, Patrick? Yeah, so, you know, my heresy for this week, and when you think of a contrarian play, you know, as always, it's, well, you know, who's not, who's the guy that most people aren't going to be going with? Um, so I try to look at exactly that, you know, who's been productive, how the defense has been that they're playing against what, you know, what that matchup looks like. Um, and this is the guy that stuck out. Um, and it's Russell Wilson, uh, $7,700, the giants at the Seahawks. Russ is the highest priced quarterback on the slate this weekend. The G men have surprisingly been very good against opposing quarterbacks on the season. The fifth fewest points at just under 16, a game, the last four, the fourth fewest points at just over 10 points a game. Big Russ was arguably the best player, period, in the NFL over the course of the first eight games this year at almost 32 fantasy points a game. But over the last three games, he hasn't been that impressive. Just under 16 fantasy points a game. Um, so half um, of the production that we saw. Um, on paper, this just doesn't look like a very favorable matchup for Big Russ. However, when you dive into some of the quarterbacks that the Giants have faced so far this year, you see names like Big Ben and Trubisky and Mullins and Goff, Dalton, Kyle Allen, Carson Wentz a couple times, Brady, Alex Smith, uh, Brandon Allen in Cincinnati. And of all those guys, Brady is the only quarterback to rank in the top 10 for fantasy points per game. At number nine, with almost 22. Furthermore, only Ben and Wentz are even in the top 20. Uh, the opposing signal callers have just been subpar at best. Um, but those three guys, I mean, what they have in common um, is that they're the only quarterbacks to score more than 20 fantasy points a game against the Giants uh, this season. So Big Russ comes in scoring the fourth most fantasy points a game at the position. Um, he needs a get me right game. Uh, on paper, this was uh, an easy one for me. It's what I saw. So he's my contrarian for this week. Man, I got to tell you, for the reason that you're not going to expect, I, I'm extremely disappointed in in that segment there from you because in the notes, it's got a question in there posed to me of, do I know <laughs> what all three of those guys have in common? And I had a joke about your mother ready to go, and uh, and I didn't even get to use it. 
Um, so I'm pissed off, and I'm going to move on to my heresy of the week because I don't want to talk yeah. about it. I had a feeling that's why I skipped oh, it. I was all ready to go. I was just chomping at the bit, and you just you stole it from me, and I'm pissed off about it. I'm sorry. Uh, my contrarian play this week um, actually is going to come with a fun little story, Patrick, so I hope you got some cookies and milk because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little tale. I'm oh, going boy. Mike Glennon. He's 4800 bucks this week um, as the Jags take on the Vikings. We've talked about this game. So fun fact here for you, Patrick. You already know this, but last week I got a little bit goofy in a little dime time, rolled out all 20 lineups with a double-stacked Mike Lennon. Well, guess what, buddy? I binked that son of a bitch. On my $2 worth of entry fees, I brought back 47 bucks and some change. All the money that I saved between Glennon and the guys I stacked him with allowed me to surround them with great options. I ended up with a handful of lineups that had Henry and Hill in it, which is, you know, ultimately the reason that I won. So Mm -hmm. out of about 2,000 entries, I brought home about 25% of that prize pool with my Mike Glennon stack. So enough about me, though, here. Let's talk about the matchup, Patrick. Vikings giving up the seventh, I'm sorry, the 11th. Most points per game against QBs. So that's a solid matchup, but nothing quite that jumps off the page. Um, you know, that's going to bump up Glennon's ownership. More importantly, the Vikings are giving up the second most points per game to wide receivers. So Glennon should be able to toss the ball around with success. He's going to be under 5% owned. Once again, it's going to allow you to surround him, um, you know, with a guy or guys that you stack him with and give you plenty of quality options if you want to go for a takedown. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Mike Mike Glennon, uh, you know, when you told me what you were doing last week, I uh, chuckled about it a little bit myself, but it definitely worked out for you. It paid off. Um, gold mine. Yeah. Mike Glennon, gold mine. Yeah, right. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I think that this is going to be, um, you know, a game where Kirk Cousins actually shines and, and puts up some numbers. So Glennon's going to have to chuck the ball around. Um, I think he's got all of his receivers back. I believe Shark is going to be um, at full capacity this week too. So um, he's got some nice options to toss the ball to. And, you know, the kid in the backfield, the undrafted rookie, um, has continued to impress um, throughout the season. And I think he's going he's gonna to have another good game this weekend as well. So He should. He should. Let me get to my uh... – let me get to my Hail Mary here first because I think yours is yours is a little bit more traditional. Um, and so let, let me just go ahead and, and go my Hail Mary this week. Um, Mr. Carson Wentz, 5400 bucks. Eagles at the Packers. Now, man, how bad are things for Carson Wentz that he even qualifies as a Hail Mary these days? He is, yeah, he is horrible. Yeah, he has arguably been the worst starting quarterback this year in real life. Now, yep. for DFS purposes, however, oddly enough, dude has been worth his um, weight in salt, man. In seven of the 12 games this year, he has surpassed the 3X mark. Four of those 12, he has actually surpassed the 4X mark. So all things considered, he hasn't been nearly as bad for DFS as real life. So I think this is going to allow him a pretty low ownership. I'm fairly confident to say he's going to be, you know, 1% or less. And so as long as he doesn't get replaced by Jalen Hurts, he definitely has a decent shot at hitting value. Now, Packers are pretty good against the pass. pass. They give up uh, the the eighth least points per game to quarterback. Uh, And that's mostly because they get absolutely gashed on the ground. But I think all these reasons uh, do allow you to be one of the few uh, that could roster Wentz. And he's going to have, uh, well, he should have, uh, Zach Ertz back again this week. So, you know, his weapons are finally healthy. I'm not advocating for a lot of it, but you definitely could do a lot worse than rolling out some Wentz. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, even if Ertz isn't back, Dallas Goddard is a pretty viable option at the tight end position as well. Um, and, yeah, Carson Wentz is, uh, like you said, statistically in the fantasy world, um he actually is is pretty decent. He's in the top half of the NFL, uh, you know, for points a game for the for the position. So, uh, but the eye test, man, it's brutal watching him 
Um, it's like he has absolutely no idea what's going on on the field out there. Um, and he's, he's just an absolute dumpster fire. Uh, so, you know, my Hail Mary for this, this week um, is a tight end for the Tennessee Titans, and it's Anthony Ferkser. Only $2,500 this week, um, and they got the Cleveland Browns coming to town. Uh, there's no John U. Smith this week. He's out. Smith and Ferkster have combined uh, and are making up for over 26% of that team target share this season. John U. Smith's seven touchdowns that he has receiving on the year have all been red zone targets. Did I mention that Cleveland is giving up the second most fantasy points a game to opposing tight ends on the season at over 15 and a half? And over the last four weeks, they're giving up a whopping 20. Cleveland has given up the third fewest fantasy points a game to opposing receivers over the last four weeks at just over 25. So Tannehill is going to have to look elsewhere. $2,500 is a steal for Ferkser this weekend. I feel his floor is that magical 4X benchmark. Go out, win yourself a tournament with Anthony Ferkser this weekend. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I do think that he's going to be the highest owned tight end on the slate, probably, you know, somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent neighborhood with, you know, uh, at least the John being out. But, I mean, he did have a game earlier this year in a, you know, equally good matchup against the Texans. It was week six. He had eight yep. catches for 113 yards and a touch. Uh, that went for almost 30 points. So, you know, 10, 10 points to get that 4X isn't really asking a whole lot. Um, uh, he's just, he's just going to be highly owned is the only issue. But, um, you know, tight end is a position that most of us like to, and I definitely like to punt um, just as far as salary-wise, not necessarily talent-wise, but salary-wise. And, you know, 2500 bucks for you know, a guy that is in a pretty damn good spot, um, you know, high owned or not is definitely going to be someone that I'm going to heavily have in play. Yep. Uh, and you look at, you know, some of these other tight ends in the lineup, like Waller and Hawkinson and, um, even Ingram, uh, you know, it does look like Ertz is going to be back as well. So, um, you know, I think that those guys and Robert Tanyan is another one, um, that all have some pretty decent matchups this week. So, um, albeit, yeah, he's first is going to get a lot of run. Um, I think that, you know, some people are going to be just unaware. I don't know. That's I'll tell you, for, for a variety of reasons, um, the guy that I think I'm going to be most heavily invested in at, at tight end is actually going to be Jordan Aikens. And a lot of that is just going to revolve around the fact of, you know, Will Fuller's out, and I'm going to be playing a decent amount of Watson this week. And, um, you know, Aikens, I I believe, is going to line up um, quite a bit in the slot this week. So you can you might be able to kind of get a, a $2,900 receiver out of the tight end position this week. He's going to be highly owned as well. I think he's probably going to be second or third highest owned tight end on the slate, but um, much, much, much more difficult matchup. We're literally talking about like, you know, Aikens having, you know, the toughest matchup for tight ends where, you know, Fersker has a much easier matchup. But if, you know, A.J. Brown is out, um, you know, for the Titans, that definitely opens it up. If you don't have any A.J. Brown and you don't have any John U. Smith, I mean, that doesn't leave a whole lot to throw to. You got Corey Davis, Adam Humphreys, um, you know, Fersker, and then, you know, the guy delivering my mail yesterday, you know, is there, is there a catching option? So, um, you know, that, that definitely raises his value even more if AJ Brown ends up being out as well. Yeah. And it looks like, uh, the latest report on Brown, uh, is that he is good to go for Sunday. Okay. Well, so. either way, if he's limited, even, you know what I mean? Um, cool. you know, he's got a hip injury, so that, that, I mean, pretty much any injury, I guess, will affect a receiver, you know, whatever part of his body. Um, 
you know, and that, that could be a lower scoring game too. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I Janu or not Janu, but first here is going to be a good play this week. All right, my man. Well, that is all I've got, unless you've got something to add. No, sir. I just want to point out that I am already in our contest this week, so you do not get a free pass. You're going to have to build a lineup um, to, to beat me this week. So I, I I do look forward to hosting the show next week. Awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, with that, uh, we just want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to give us a listen. Uh, we truly do appreciate it. You know, quite a bit of time and effort goes into this uh, above and beyond, you know, probably what you think. And, you know, real life happens to, to creep in now and again. And, um, you know, we make the time to do this. And so we appreciate your support. So with that, Patrick, we're going to go ahead and head on out. I wish you the best of luck this week, my friend. You too, buddy. And uh, good luck, everybody. <laughs>